Art has never accelerated faster than today, and the digital art era is here. AI and art creation tools empower anyone to create it. Blockchain technologies allow anyone to own it. VR, AR, and mixed reality immerse us in it. Let's talk to the artists and the innovators behind visual magic that defines not only galleries, but apps, games, movies, social networks, and far more. I'm your host, Roger Dickerman. Welcome to the future of art. Today, we welcome Barat, art collector and quote unquote JPEG connoisseur, decentralization advocate, general partner at 6529 Capital, 3D visionary, and head of strategy and growth at OnCyber, a world building engine for Web 3D. Barat is an endless source of wisdom, and he is uniquely positioned to understand art, its collectability, and where it's headed. Let's get to it. Barat, welcome to the future of art. Hey, thank you, Roger. Appreciate it, man. Great to be here. You are one of the most distinguished personalities in the digital art space and beyond. It's one of the reasons why I was excited to do this, literally episode one with you. There's a lot of reasons why I want to kick this off together. Um, how do you feel about art? I love art, right? I'm passionate about art. I loved art even before I got into the Web3 space, before I got into NFTs and crypto, but uh, always been you know, a passionate uh, uh, fan of art. Um, I think a lot of my art interests came from my parents who were also very, you know, big collectors themselves. And, uh, you know, they had art all over the home. And I think that was something that I grew up with. And, you know, as I got older and I was able to afford art, you know, I, I bought some traditional pieces. And, uh, you know, ever since then, it was kind of diving into the rabbit hole, right? And crypto and Web3 just catalyzed that entire process and made it so easy that I just fell in love with digital art and uh, the ability to buy art from a frictionless perspective. So when was the first time, you referenced your parents there, when was the first time that art, the concept of art actually entered your world, either in association with a specific work of art or the concept in general? I think it was probably um, maybe, maybe seven or eight, somewhere in that age range, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a couple of pieces of art back in India, actually, that my parents had that they had put up that just, you know, grabbed my attention, right? I was like, wow, these are some pretty impressive pieces that you actually, you know, you felt like you could be in that scene and you could connect with the scene and uh, the imagery of it. And uh, I think that was probably my first like, hey, this is kind of cool. This is new. This is different. It's kind of cool. Um, and, you know, kind of really got my brain going about art. I was never an artist, by the way, right? So I can't draw for the life of me. I suck at art. Um, and, uh, you know, I need a lot of assistance. I need paint by numbers, if you will, to be effective. So it was something that my logical brain, you know, just said, hey, this is cool. You can never do it, but you can at least enjoy it, right? <laughs> it was kind of the, was kind of the, uh, the concept. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's been kind of that way ever since. Which is really interesting because I think you have a really, uh, you are a curator. You are a curator. I've been in your own cyber museum. I mean, you, you, you have a good eye for art in my own personal opinion. So it's interesting to hear you say that you have no personal experience, even from a sketching perspective or, or, or anything, no, no art skill. I have very little art skill. I mean, I, I'm just being honest, right, with myself. Um, I, I pretty much suck, right? I mean, there's a piece, <laughs> there, there's a piece that I did with Fiwo and, uh, you know, if I didn't have Fiwo with me, you know, kind of doing his work and me kind of like doodling on the side and, you know, us trying to make something that kind of fit together, I would, I would be terrible, right? I mean, I, I think just if you left me with a paintbrush and a paint, uh, you know, and a canvas, I would probably, you know, destroy it, right? It, it would be some modern you know, horrific outcome, but, um, but yeah, I, I think I do have a sense of art sensibility. So I, I will say, I think I, I have like some sense of color and aesthetics. And I, I think I have some level of taste, I guess. Um, I wouldn't call myself a connoisseur, but I think over time I've, I've developed my own sort of taste and aesthetic and, you know, it, it seems to, it seems to, it seems to, you know, hold, um, 
some some value. So I, I guess I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that at least my eye is better than my my brush stroke. Well, there we go. We could both agree. We could both credit you for that. Now let's take a step back from taste and aesthetic. I'm going to ask you a very broad question. How do you define art? Wow, um, art is art is beauty. Art is connection. Art is heart. Right. I mean, it's just there's just so many ways I could describe art, but it really is. Um, it's it's a it's a personal connection in visual observation uh, that you make with a piece, right? And it's the way that the brain, the heart, and the picture kind of connect. And also that relationship extends to the artist itself. But that entire connection is a 360 degree connection that is the way that I define art, right? I mean, it's not, it's very hard for me to put it in words that are, you know, um, simplistic, because it really is, for me to buy a piece, there usually is this process that I go through, and I see a piece, and then it just jumps out at me. But it's like an immediate reaction, it says, Hey, I'm here, you may want to hit the brakes and just take a look. And then my brain processes it, right? So at first, it's hard, but then my brain processes it. And then what I find is like usually 24 hours later, 36 hours later, I find that I'm still thinking about that piece, right? And this is where the heart continues to pull. And, uh, you know, I find that if I'm still in that mode and I'm thinking about it and I'm checking, is it gone? Is it sold? Um, you know, or is it still available? That it likely is a piece that I need to buy because it has that kind of an impact on me, right? And uh, it's that connection overall is the way that I view art, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, it really is. It's like a heart, brain, artist, you know, vibe, right? And, and connection overall. It's beautiful. It's, it's very, very well said. Now, how do you express that first? So you reference that specific sort of gestation period where he sticks with you and you consider whether it's been sold or not. When was the first opportunity you had to collect and to buy a work of art? Well, in the NFT space, it was, you know, I think I bought like the first art art piece probably in 2019, right? I bought my first NFT in 2018, uh, some period. But 2019 was my first art art piece, digital art piece rather. And I would say that, um, you know, it was, I think it was on Super Rare, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, just being on that platform and seeing how easy it was to look at curation, look at how art was, you know, depicted and presented and how you could actually look at the details of the description behind the art, right? Like the way that the artist outlined what that work meant. So that visual connection that then tied into a description of what the arts, the artist's method was behind the art and the ability to be able to sort of frictionlessly buy it were all very powerful for me, right? So I found like the platforms at that time, um, which were basically super rare and known origin. I don't think any of the other uh, other platforms existed. OpenSea was around, of course, um, as an aggregator even back then. But um, there was not a lot of FOMO, right? So you could actually look at art and enjoy art. And there weren't a huge number of collectors either, right? So it was probably me and, you know, maybe two dozen other collectors. And there were probably probably, you know, maybe three times as many artists, right? So maybe there were like 25, 30 artists and there were probably, you know, a dozen collectors or two dozen collectors at the time, right? Which is kind of interesting because then you really get to look at work. You get to spend your time, you know, enjoying them. And uh, anyway, long story short, that was the period where, you know, I discovered X Copy, I discovered Hackatow, I discovered Coldy, I discovered Miss Al Simpson, right? All of these OGs of that period who were really sort of, you know, the, the kind of the first, what I would say, digital artists that actually sort of built a reputation on a platform and, you know, kind of almost started the digital art movement, right? Yeah, there were other sort of platforms and art that were launched before that period, but it was less curated, right? I mean, you could talk about the rare pepes and the fake rares and all that stuff, right? But like when you think of a platform and you think about curation and you think about that entire process of making it, Inertia free, super rare was the first platform. No origin was probably, you know, right there with them. But um that was that was kind of the the moment, right? And that was kind of the experience that really got me sucked into the rabbit hole. 
When you collected that first work of art, did you think you'd go on to collect a thousand? Oh my gosh. I, I had no idea what I was in for. Right. And uh, in fact, that first few months of 2019, it, 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 the interesting thing is I got into, I got into DeFi probably slightly before I got into NFTs. Right. And DeFi for me was a very big moment because it was, you know, the art of the possible on, you know, Ethereum and smart contracts and, you know, just understanding all of what was happening, you know, really opened my brain to like the tech side of things, right? I'm a, I'm a technologist by trade. So it opened the tech side of things for me. And then when I saw art and I saw how smart contracts and how art and, you know, art was kind of frictionlessly available to be bought, you know, again, using Ethereum, not going through a traditional auction house, not paying 25% you know, gatekeeper fees. And it was just so like personal and so individualistic. So, you know, kind of artist to buyer and collector with no in-betweens that, that aspect of it was really powerful for me. And it, it was like, it was an aha moment where I said, okay, yeah, this is, this is something different and I'm going to be spending time here. And I kind of knew that it was going to be something that I couldn't, you know, like slow myself down on. You know, once I jumped into that rabbit hole, I was like, yeah, this is this is going to be something right. I'm, I'm going to be spending a ton of my time, you know, buying art, right, because it was hard. Once you start, it was hard to stop. It's a deep rabbit hole for sure. For sure. It's a deep, so very deep. If we could take you back there to 2019, and I know it's borderline impossible, but let's try to unbias ourselves. And if I'm posing two questions to you in the year 2019, the first question being, what is the future of art? How do you think you would have answered it then? I would have said the future of art is digital, right? I mean, I, I at that point, after I'd been in it for a few months, I would have said the future of art is digital. The future of art is very personal. The future of art is, you know, very open, right? I guess I would have described it those three ways um, because it is like this entire open marketplace where buyer and seller, artist and collector, right, could interact in this completely open, you know, landscape and environment with very little, like, uh, inertia in between. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was easy to see that that would only become more of a, um, you know, an, an effective sort of uh, approach looking forward, right? It, 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 there was no way you could sort of rewind that. So I think that that aspect of it, that aspect of the experience is what I felt the future of art would be. If I were to sort of look back and say, hey, what did that do for you at that point? And, uh, you know, did that play out? I absolutely would sort of say the same thing again, right? Yeah. And it's it's kind of held true almost four years later, right? Um, of course, I wish the platforms had advanced a lot more than they have, but the the very basic nature of the buying and selling process has held true. Um, so I think that part of it is is absolutely um you know, it's absolutely on point. Okay, that was the warm up. Now the harder question. As unbiased as possible, what artists did you look at in 2019 and think there would be a long, bright future? And I know you mentioned a lot of exceptional names earlier, but if you had to pick just one that in that moment of calm with only a few more multiples artists and collectors and, and you had time to breathe and, and think and consider what artists really caught your eye and, and made you stop and stare? You know, it's kind of funny. That's it's a really great question, and my answer is probably going to be very counter to what most people will expect. I will say that it was probably coldy for me, right? And um, I remember, you know, I like I, I bought early X copies. I had two X copies, I believe. I had, you know, a few Hackatows, and mind you, I I paid like fifty bucks for these one of ones, right? So Ethereum at the time was like fifty bucks, so I paid like an ETH, right? So I was very early to these guys, right, is, is the key. But Coldy and what he did with Decentralized, that entire series, right, and especially with, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto and then with uh, Vitalik Buterin, right, he created, like, this 3D ventricular sort of um, movement around the work and how Finney was on one side of Satoshi, right, and then it had the Bitcoin white paper on the back. And the same way with you know, the decentralized for Vitalik Buterin, it had the Ethereum white paper on the back. That to me was like, man, you've just taken, you know, the face of these individuals, right? 
And of course, Satoshi is not really the Satoshi that we often see depicted, but you, you take the face of these individuals and you take legends like Hal Finney, you take the white paper and you create this 3D ventricular art with it. And it embodied to me what the art of the possible was with 3D art, right? Just the power of 3D art. Now, if I had a, a flat you know, piece of art on my wall, you know, other than having that digital piece you know, depicted in a nice digital art frame, you know, there's no way to do that, right? To pull off that experience. And that to me was like, okay, wow, this is the way digital art should be. So that's why Coldy was very, very like top of mind for me. But I would say Hackatow and, Col uh, Hackatow and Xcopy were the same too, right? Because the idea of glitch art and the idea of tattoo art when it came to Hackatow, these were all things that were like, holy crap, right? In a digital art form, these just really pop. They really pop, right? They catch your eye and you are so like, you're so pulled into it that uh, it's quite amazing. It's quite impressive, right? And quite immersive. And I could definitely see that they had a unique DNA. All three of them had a unique patent and DNA and style that was very noticeable among their work, which told me that, hey, these folks are going to have a long, long, long future ahead because that that strand, that that thread that pulls all the way through their work is going to really sort of, you know, take them places, right, over time. So, um, but I guess that, that's where I'd, I'd go with it. There are two roads I want to go down. Now, I want to continue on your collector journey first, but I also want to double click back into that 3D concept later. As you know, that's, that's near and dear to my heart. And I, I find it fascinating that you keyed in on that aspect of Colby's Decentralized. Um, big, big Colby fan as well. So it's interesting you looked at it in that moment and, and saw that 3D nature specifically. But let's save that for a moment. So you mentioned the three artists there were framed in the year 2019. Give us a, a TLDR on your collector journey from 2019 all the way to present day, 2023. Really, one of the things that I, I, um, I feel really proud of is from 2019 to 2021, I probably collected more one of one pieces of art than most people, right? I mean, there were a lot of whales that came in second half of 21 that, you know, threw a bunch of money into the space and bought a bunch of, you know, grail art. But like, if you look at like long tail artists, like people that, you know, were new artists into the space that, you know, didn't have a previous following that then went on to kind of blow up or be super successful. You know, I, I like to think I had a small part to play in the gestation period of a lot of those artists that came into the digital space, right? So there were several of those individuals that I would say over the course of 2019 to 2021, the first half of 2021, where I, um, you know, I just, you know, I, I collected a significant amount of one-of-one one art. A lot of people were very focused on buying punks at that time. And I was very focused on one-of-one one artists, right? And I would say that from there, from like the 2021, the second half, you know, I, I did have a few punks and all that stuff. I did start, you know, dabbling into a few of the PFP collections here and there in addition to one of one art. But like my journey has always been like very high conviction artists with, you know, a certain patented style that appealed to me. And I would, you know, in many cases, you know, make multiple bets on those artists, right? So, um it was kind of it was kind of my approach. And I, I did that, by the way, across platforms, right? So I wasn't like a super rare snob, although for the longest time I was like a top five collector and a top I'm still a top ten, I think, or close to a top ten collector all time on super rare. But I was also a, a prolific bar and foundation as well and you know, known and other platforms. I'm I'm like an equal opportunity um buyer, if you will. <laughs> right. So um that was a part of the process. So in that sense, just a means to the end of art. Correct. Correct. I could care less. Right. If I could secure a grail piece of art and it was on your platform, another platform or a sixth platform, I would buy it anywhere. I think you know that, too, because, you know, obviously Artifacts was a big part of my journey as well. And I collected a lot of grail art there as well. So I would buy anywhere as long as there was great art and great curation. That was those were the two key things for me. Right. Is that, you know, great art, great curation, um, strong platforms, you know, all, all those things kind of made sense. So while we're on the subject of platform agnostic, I would ask you the same question about chain. Do you feel the same way about chains or is there a different interpretation there? I, um, you know, I, I'm kind of, I hate to say it, but I'm a bit of an Ethereum snob over the years um, just because I think that the development of the Ethereum network 
um, and the power laws that went into the creation of the network and the developer ecosystem, you know, puts it on such a different level, uh, such a different playing field from everybody else, right? And I, I oh, by the way, I'm a, a big Solana fan too, right? But like, it, it's it's like not even close, right? And you know, there are other platforms that are great for art, like Tezos, um, you know, and the Tezos blockchain and stuff like that. But um, like, I always come back because of the network and the power law effects of Ethereum. And, you know, I feel like, you know, my primary buying is always going to be on Ethereum, right? As long as the platform remains viable, as long as the network remains viable, you know, it will be the primary spot that I do my buying just because, you know, it's not that I, it's not that I ever buy with an interest of selling. I, I almost never sell my one of one art, right? It's like buy and hold forever, if you will, right? Is kind of my, my thesis with one of one art. PFPs, I will flip, you know, as appropriate as I see fit, um, you know, but um, so I, I'm less fussed about the chains, but I also feel like the provenance is important. And that's where I think Ethereum is like the de facto network and why I concentrate my buying on Ethereum, right? Because if provenance didn't mean something, then you could be multi-chain, you could buy art anywhere, but like, you know, having that ability to be able to like have art be seen and have the biggest network of, you know, artists um, on a platform, a set of platforms or on a chain and, you know, the largest set of collectors on those chains all help with the overall, you know, growing of that ecosystem and expansion of that ecosystem at large. Right. So, you know, for that reason, I'm, I'm like an Ethereum snob. Right. But, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I invest in Solana. I was very early, you know, in Solana. Um, so I have no issues with other chains per se, right? And I continue to invest in other uh, networks as well, um, you know, so I, I'm definitely not a snob when it comes to, you know, investing in tokens, but when it comes to investing in art, I am definitely somewhat of a snob. How did the recent developments on Bitcoin fit into the thesis? Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I hate to say this, but I view it as... Um, I view it as a um, a way of Bitcoin gaining relevance, right? This was a narrative that it, it, if you take the non-maxis, right? Or you, you take the maxis of like 2016 through 2019, right? Let, let's, say it's, let's say it's the 2016 through 2020 maxis, right? Before Ethereum just really took off, right? Those maxis started to realize that, you know, Bitcoin as a network was falling out of, um, real purported value, right? The use case was store of value, right? And why is it a store of value? Because the network is largely useless, right? I mean, I, I hate to say it. And by the way, I'm a Bitcoin fanboy. I love the store of value aspect of Bitcoin. I like the permanence of the network. I like proof of work, right? So I'm, I'm completely on board with all that stuff. But as a usable functioning network, not great, right? Not great. So if you think about what the ordinal sort of uh, movement did was it allowed, you know, this permanent art to be inscribed in block space that was largely going useless, right? Um, and it allowed those pseudo maxis, the fringe maxis, who now have come out and kind of are on the other side of it, right? Because they they saw what was happening with the Ethereum ecosystem, they saw what was happening with NFTs, they saw the power of you know those network effects. And they softened up, right? And I don't want to name names here, but you know, there's some very high visible, highly visible sort of Bitcoin former Bitcoin maxis who are now suddenly art aficionados on Bitcoin, right? And then they call out the other maxis that exist in Bitcoin, which is kind of interesting. But uh, but it, it's it's a curiosity and it's it's definitely interesting. But I will say there's something about ordinal inscription on Bitcoin that's actually quite powerful, right? Because it's the the power of the network and the power of the fact that like you know no one's going to stop the Bitcoin network, right? So having art on chain, um, on, on Bitcoin, uh, on the on the BTC network is actually very powerful. But like, I think it's a curiosity. I think the early, you know, inscriptions will have some value. I think original inscriptions will have some value. I think other than that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, I think, will, will there be power law um, effects? Absolutely, right? In time, there's going to be power law effects on art on Bitcoin as well. But I think as a functioning tradable set of, um, uh, you know, art pieces, 
I don't think anybody is going to do anything very, very um, cool on the network, right? It's also super expensive, right, to inscribe. So that's why you see this really low poly, like, you know, pixelated art for the most part on ordinals, as opposed to really rich 3D, you know, just ultra highly rendered art on Ethereum, right? Um, you can you can do any kind of art on Ethereum, right? It's not a problem, but there's a limitation. I mean, you, you have a, a price performance limitation on Bitcoin that is going to impact what art you put on chain. But uh, that's my long-winded story there. Yeah, the, the piece of the Bitcoin network that I'm so fascinated about, I just feel like the permanence, the, the relative permanence of the network and provenance goes so well together. So if, if I'm making my pitch for Bitcoin, which I'm not, by the way, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm still in thesis development. I, mm-hmm. I've, done, I've done some interesting exploration there, but I'm, I'm, I'm still very much soaking it in and, and developing that. But if I were to make a, a, a less educational pitch, I would absolutely start there with the two Ps. Yeah, I to- I'm totally with you, man. We are, we are aligned at the hip on that. So before we move out of Barat as the collector, uh, and we get to, to to 3D and some of the other things that you're doing. Give us a few stops between 2019 and 2023 of art pieces or artists that that spoke to you. Maybe a good story or two of how you acquired a prized a prized artwork. 2021 is an interesting period because 20. If you look at 2018 to 2021, there was this OG period where you can like very clearly define who the great artists of that period where we talked about, you know, three of the amazing artists from that period. Then you saw in 2020, you saw two really emergent superstars, right? Trevor Jones was one of them. And by the way, there were many others. Don't just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super, I'm super netting things out. Right. So I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, rude and forget anybody here in this process, but Trevor Jones would be one of them and Fuocious would be another, right? These were like what I would call, the 2020 grail artists uh, of that period. And there were mul- multiple others as well, but these are top of mind to me. Um, and then, you know, going into 2021, you know, obviously there were, you know, several others as well, but the re and people is, people is in the 2020 category too, by the way, I'm sorry. How can I forget people? Right. Um, and what happened with um, the entire sort of uh, $69 million um, end of year transaction. But um, you know, it, you take those three, individuals in 2020, um, obviously very powerful and, you know, had a big impact on me um, in 2021, because a, a lot of the work, for example, that Trevor Jones did, you know, it had this, like, really, you know, it, it pulled on a few different things that I was very um, into crypto for. One, it pulled on this whole aspect of Bitcoin and Bitcoin art imagery. And then the aspect of like the you know, the nature of using digital art in a format that actually, you know, kind of really lent, lent, lent itself really well to, you know, a digital format, you know, just with the way that he manipulated, you know, whether it was, you know, the Bitcoin currency, the bull, right, all of those things, right. Um, and then Fiwosh's had a very patented style, right, a really patented style. You know, when you look at Fiwosh's work, you can see the eyes, right? You can see the colors and you can immediately know that it's a ferocious piece. And by the way, it could be a black and white piece, but you knew that that work was also ferocious, right? And it was just the way that the ink drips, right? And those were really powerful things. And of course, Beeple has his style, right? It's just that I I can't even describe Beeple's style. It's just amazing, right? And it's so mimetic always. Um, I would say they they were sort of played a large part in 2020. By the way, I didn't collect... I think I collected um, a Beeple piece in 2020, uh, but I didn't collect the other two, right? And I started collecting them in 2021 um, and definitely artists that impacted me. And then as I got into 2021, I was looking for ways that I could start to collect their art, right? Um, And I would say that um, the Sotheby's auction, actually, I'm sorry, the Christie's auction where Thiewo had all five years, right? um, Mm -hmm. Of his work was just it blew my mind right i happened to be on you know i happened to see the fall the, the kind of the lead-ins to that auction and you know i was following ferocious for a while and i just knew in my heart that i had to i had to sort of uh you know collect a ferocious period right a ferocious piece and i knew it had to be one of those years and um you know i spent a lot of time like studying all five years right i went into details on every single piece in all five years and uh, I ended up with um, 
age 17, year four. And the reason I picked that is because it was his coming out piece, right? I am Victor. I am Victor. Mm -hmm. And that was so powerful for me, right? And when I looked at all of the pieces in that set, there were 18 one of ones in that set. Um, you know, I was just, I was blown away. I, I, and I, I spent a lot of time on all these pieces, by the way, right? On every single one of them. But like that just captured me. And uh, I, I was like, there's no way I'm not going to win this auction, right? Absolutely no way I'm not going to win this auction. And, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, fortunately, I, you know, I, I kind of like tested the water on, you know, age two, I mean, it, like two of the other sort of periods and, you know, just to see who was, I, you didn't know who was bidding because it's all uh, completely done anonymously, right? But I was watching the way that people were sort of, um, you know, bidding up and bidding down because I wanted to make sure that, you know, I wasn't caught in some technical snafu and, you know, somehow lost the piece because, you know, tech kind of screwed me, right? Um, and then when it came time for that piece, I just like, you know, I just, I said, no matter what, <laughs> I am going to take this piece, right? If I have to drop a widow maker on somebody, I'm going to do it. But that, that's, that's, how that, that's, that's how that auction went down. Fortunately, I, I won the piece, right? Um, and then had the pleasure of having Fiwa come spend time with me at home and deliver the, the beautiful sort of, uh, you know, um, the beautiful chest that he made with all the pieces in there it was just an amazing experience for us. So I love that. But like Fiwosius would be one of those artists in that period. Uh, but there were so many others, right? Like DK Motion. Um, I, I remember like first seeing DK's art on foundation and uh, super rare. And, you know, I, I knew instinctively right away, right? Like DK is going to be a superstar. And by the way, at that point in time, he was still working at Apple, if I remember correctly. Right. So he was still an animator for Apple. And uh, I was just like completely, you know, blown away by the way that, you know, his animations um, were, you know, so mimetic, so catchy, right? Had so much character and spunk and comedy to them, right? And, um, you know, I, I remember I, you know, been on many of his pieces, and then I was fortunate enough to win virtual game on uh, Super Rare. Um, and Mondoir and I had a, I think we had a, a pretty good, like, auction battle on that one. And uh, shortly after that, you know, I was very fortunate to pick up Happy Virus as well, which is probably one of his favorite pieces he will never admit it but it's one of his favorite pieces it's a piece that he always you know he always says hey i would love to buy that back from you right <laughs> but i think ode it's an ode to his uh his you know current wife and you know at the time maybe his fiance but um you know it, it's definitely a very personal piece to him and uh you know dk is another person alpha centauri kid right ack i had pre ack pieces right so from when he was just starting to hit the the space, right? He actually did, it was interesting. He did a, a piece for my Amoebits. So he did a one of one that was one of my um, pig, my pigs, Amoebit pigs that had a um, men in black uniform on, right? So the black suit on. And then my visitor Amoebit. And, uh, you know, it's it, I, it, I call the, the, the Amoebit pig the oinker in chief. And like in this picture, you know, the oinker in chief is actually pointing up at a piece of art on a wall and the visitor is like taking it in, right? The visitor me bits taking it in. But that was like one of his very early pieces. And I, you know, I remember buying that and this was like before ACK blew up, right? But like, there's so many of those examples. I mean, like there's so many other artists like Archon Nair, um, you know, there's so many other folks that, you know, um, I bought pieces of during that period that are, you know, like rock stars, right? They're really sort of continuing to kill it. And it's amazing to see, like Michael, uh, MP Cause is another person, right? I bought his piece on um, on Foundation, uh, Perpetua Perpetuation Plein Air. And he went on to do some amazing drops, the Chimera drop in Art Blocks Curated and several others, right? And he's absolutely killing it, right? Ryan Talbot, so many folks that were during that 2021 period, which, you know, it was just amazing to sort of be able to collect from those artists during a period when like the FOMO was still not there, right? Like you could buy great art and, uh, you know, <laughs> you still were, you know, in, in a position to not be like caught up in FOMO and you could actually bid on art and you could see and talk to artists and stuff like that. Right. But I know that's a long, long story there, but, uh, that was a little bit of it. It did feel like a different era, but that's actually where I crossed your path first. It was 2021. And it was, you know, around one of one art and, and, and 3D art as well, which is somewhere I want to go. But I remember 
you, I believe, have the Bill Ellis, the Fuck Render, and the Victor Mascara one of one artifacts pieces. That's correct. And three super, super grail artists, right? I mean, like three tremendous artists that I was actually collecting on other platforms as well. And when I had the option to buy them on artifacts, right? And here's, again, being opportunistic, right? As a collector, you buy wherever you can secure great art, right? And if you're not, you're, you're kind of, you've lost the plot, right? That means you are like a platform snob. That means you put a platform above the art itself, right? And by the way, this is not me saying that Artifacts wasn't an amazing platform. I loved Artifacts. I think I, I was bidding there like constantly. And the reason was it was so under the radar, right? What you had built was a tremendous platform with some of the best artists in the space and with amazing curation because you had those one-of-one -one pieces, but you had these very deeply immersive 3D pieces as well, right? So the entire story among uh, about that work just popped in the way that you like, you know, showed the pieces, the way that, you know, they were curated, the way that they were spoken about, but like very few people knew about it, right? It was like the best kept secret. So I used to love going in there and bidding because I was like, man, this is amazing. Like you're, you're able to get all this one of one, one, one of one art and nobody even knows and is competing with you. Right. So I enjoyed that tremendously. Right. Um, but uh, it was always super stealth. It was always on the radar, but um but you were able to like buy great art from great artists. And, you know, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Let's go into the 3D aspect of that too together, because I know now, now here's where a number of different dots are going to connect. So we were just talking about artifacts. Obviously the 3D models are a big component of that. And it's a, it's quite a unique street corner thinking about fine art and fine art 3D models. Going back to 2019, you're talking about Colby's Decentralize and, and sort of noticing that it was layered and it had a 3D nature to it and peering into the future of what that might mean. And then to connect another dot and rope it in, uh, I would go to On Cyber and the immersive experiences, the immersive 3D galleries that are able to be created there. Um, and obviously you're a key part of strategy and growth there. Connect those dots in any way you choose, but let's, let's key in on that topic of 3D and its importance. Oh, man. That is such a such a powerful like you know topic as we think about like where we are and where we're going right. I'll tell you, um, for me, like twenty twenty one was such an important year for all of these reasons, right? Um, on cyber launching, and I remember it was Vincent Van Do's, um, you know, gallery that he set up. He was like the first person to set up a gallery. I think I was like in the top five. I was in the first five people to set up a gallery in on cyber, but like. When he set his gallery up and actually took the time and like, you know, curated his pieces, I was like, man, I've got like thousands of artworks that I haven't put up yet, right? Like get off your ass and go get to it, right? So it was like a moment for me. And, um, you know, he, re he really inspired me to go go do it, right? And I actually, you know, I got off my duff and I, I did that. And what On Cyber did for me was it was a zero to one moment, right? And I can't understate that. Like when it comes to art up until that point in time, art was something you had in your wallet that you could share with people on OpenSea, right? Or you could share with other people on Super Rare, and they'd be like, oh, wow, this is cool, right? I mean, you, you, you click on a piece and you start to see the animation and you start to see all the, the details behind it, it's cool. But it wasn't like, it wasn't like slap you in the face, powerful, right? But with OnCyber, putting it into a gallery, being able to see it and experience it in a gallery in that format where your focus and attention is just in that space, right? With that aesthetic, with that art piece, it was like a, a very transformational moment for me, right? So I was very fortunate to be able to like uh, invest in a couple of rounds of on cybers, um, you know, pre-seed and seed rounds. And I struck up a conversation with Ryan and it was really because of the fact of the impact it had on me after I set my gallery up, right? And we kept talking every quarter and I knew like this, there was more here, right? Like I could see the gallery and the skeuomorphism that came with like setting up and having this digital sort of experience that mimicked a real world gallery and, and the power of it. But I felt like, man, there was so much more that's coming here, right? There's so much more to this, right? And I, I stayed very close and, you know, we talked every quarter and, you know, we would always talk about like, what's the future kind of where, where does this go? Where does this take us? Right. And, uh, you know, so he was always like, like, you got to come, you got to come join, you got to come join, right? And it was, he's kind of interesting. And, um, you know, we, we got to a point where, you know, 
he finally, you know, he's like, Hey, I remember you told me that at some stage that you were going to leave, you know, the corporate world and, you know, like jump in, you know, feet first into web three, you want to do it. And, um, you know, he kind of reminded me about the fact that I'd, I'd been saying that for a while. Right. So then I finally relented and, and I jumped in, but the long story of this, the long story and making kind of netting this out is that there is a vision of like immersibility of visualization of decentralization intersecting with community and culture, right? That all kind of ties together in this deeply immersive environment, right? Where 2D objects and 3D objects and avatars can coexist and have experiences that was just like mind-blowingly, you know, um, you know, an awareness moment for me, right? It was just like, like it's just like this aha moment for me. And, um, you know, ever since then, it's been like, yeah, okay. It's like constantly the, the synapse is firing on like, what should we be doing? How, how should we think about this? Where can we go, right? What else can be done here? And, I, you know, I, it's it's funny, like, you know, every day I'm like thinking about 10 or 15 things. Like, you know, I, I'm sure I'm at the point right now where like, you know, we have more ideas than we have time in the day to actually roll those ideas out, right? Which is, which is kind of a, it's great because, I feel like OnCyber has one of the most amazing development and product teams on the planet, right? They do more with less than any other uh, group I've seen with. And I've, I've worked with ultra large scale platforms in the past, right? So I have a, a little bit of a sense and context around this stuff and I'm always blown away by their output and productivity. But like all of this is to say that it's the perfect sweet spot for where I see, you know, art movement, metaverse experiences, you know, deeper immersion, education, fashion, you know, gaming, entertainment, all of these things kind of blending together, right? And in world um, is where I see sort of all of these things kind of uh, coming together. Give us a moment, the future of art, merge it with on cyber, how you see these things coming together, whether you want to pan out to 25, 2030, beyond, uh, give, give us a moment. And what do you see? Oh wow! Oh. If you if you kind kind of tie all of those like themes together, right? I see a future where you know individuals will you know obviously increasingly spend more time in these digital you know spaces and experiences, right? And they will be taking user generated content, right? Whether that's you know three D art that they make from scratch whether that's 3D art that they create through, you know, third-party applications, 2D art, right? Whatever it is, and they will put it up in these galleries in world where any individual around the world can experience it, right? And it's purely experiencing art for the beauty of it and for the aesthetic and the ability to share it with anybody, anywhere, anytime without having to download a plugin, right? Just if you have an internet connection, you could be some kid somewhere in the world that could never ever go to the Met, right? Or could never ever go to the Louvre, right? But can experience that art and art like that, right? From very renowned artists in a digital gallery um, and have a very immersive experience. I mean, I think that's the future of art, right? That right there is the future of art. Um, and if you also give those creators the tools to be able to mint and lazy mint, in world so that they are able to basically then also monetize, you know, in addition to actually sharing their great art and building a network effect that way, you know, even more power to them, right? Even more powerful um, for both the artists as well as the collectors and all of the viewers right in between. But that that's the future of art. The future of art, I think, is going to be very digital, right? And that has a lot to do with, you know, just the world, the, you know, the economic landscape of you know how expensive it's going to be to own a home in the future right just you know the challenge of like physical art and the limitations of access to that physical art right the limitations of space to put art up on your walls right all of these things are going to push people to a world that you know is you know going to be you know significantly expanded from an experience perspective in world hopefully it doesn't take away you know an individual's time that they spend touching grass, right? And having relationships, but definitely 
you know, a, a chunk of that time is going to be spent in these experiences, right? And that's that's where I see the future of art kind of merging and you know integrating with all of these other things that I talked about. That user generated, provable con provable content aspect is going to be very powerful, and that's why I think blockchain and blockchain tech at the heart of it, when married with broader mainstream adoption, is going to be a powerful catalyst, right? Because the challenge today is that you have a lot of like Web two firms that are kind of coming in top down and trying to figure out, you know, how blockchain fits into the world. Whereas in Web3 and crypto, we have already proven out with a cohort of very passionate users that blockchain tech works. So now taking that and mainstreaming that, right, and getting the next 10 million people in becomes a very easy catalyst when you build it around, you know, a ledger and a trustless, uh, I mean, a trustless uh, database, right? Um, and uh, that is um, that is kind of cool, right? It's it's you're inverting kind of the approach that you uh, typically take, but it it lends itself to a very powerful sort of adaption uh, mechanics for mainstream adoption. Just to bring back something that you said, I like that you went two places with the future of art. One, you clicked in on the representation of the physical world. You mentioned some museums; you go places beyond that, but. The representation of those things in accessible manner, no matter where you are, I think is fascinating. And then the other side, of course, being able to create new galleries, new experiences, new events, uh, equally as fascinating. But I, I like that you roped both of those into your vision. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see no other way, right? I think those are like those are the cross currents that we are at right now, and it's it's the only way that I see you know these experiences making sense. Because otherwise you're you're gonna have like you're gonna have very disjointed kind of experiences, right? Um, I I think it it has to happen. I mean, these things have to they will connect, right? I, I'm I'm like violently uh, <laughs> convinced that it will actually happen, right? Um, and it's actually happening right now. You went violently. <laughs> that was a very that was a very passionate plea for it. It it was even more it was even more powerful than passionate. It was violent, <laughs> <laughs> violently passionate. So let's go with some let's go with some more violently passionate points. I want you to I want you to leave as, as we get a little, little closer to the end of this episode. I want you, I want you to leave us with two concretes, and you you could be as violently passionate or as or as cold and logical as you want. But here are the the two things. Give us one thing that you absolutely expect in the future of art. It's just a matter of time. We are going to see it. Be as specific as you want, and then give us one thing that you don't necessarily expect. You won't guarantee to us today, but that you very much hope for. More curation, better curation, so that, you know, artists of all experience ranges, aesthetics, are able to find an effective marketplace to be successful, right? I mean, it, I, I think one of the, I think one of the drawbacks of the current crypto art market scene is the fact that it's largely an echo chamber, right? It's it's a circle jerk. If you think of, and you do an intersection of the collectors out there, you will find a pretty good overlap of artworks and artists in their collections, right? And that's unfortunate. That means there are a tremendous number of long tail artists that are not represented today or underrepresented because there is no curatorial approach that allows them to be seen, right? So I think one of the things that I expect to happen is that, you know, perhaps there's going to be maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe AI helps with this. Maybe perhaps it does. I don't know. Maybe it exasperates the problem. I don't know. But like I could see a future where, um, you know, machine learning algorithms and artists, you know, patented styles allow for better automatic curation so that, you know, if you like a certain piece of art, you know, you could have a recommendation engine that says, okay, there are these other artists that you should consider because, you know, think of it like, you know, you know, as, as you go to like Spotify and you like a song and all of a sudden it recommends other songs to you or like the genius engine from Apple, right? Genius bar from Apple, same thing, but like machine learning algorithms that will help us with better curation because the moment you put a human in the middle of it, the human has bias, right? And the bias will be what that individual, she or he knows, and their aesthetic and their tastes 
and their likes and dislikes that play out in terms of who they would actually recommend. But if you start to train people on ML models or you tra start to train systems on ML models, right? And platforms on ML models, then you have a much more neutral, unbiased approach to art interpretation, to finding you know, the next five recommendations, to helping long tail artists get a little bit more access, right? Um, I think that would be an area that I, I'm really, really kind of very optimistic and hopeful because otherwise, you know, outside of like major branding and marketing, which is, you know, kind of the opposite of what artists like to do in general and social construction, um, I think those artists are not going to be seen, right? And then they're going to wither away and they're going to go do other things. They're going to move to other professions and that would be a tragedy for the creative space at large, right? Because if we're moving digital, we want to make sure that those creatives, you know, are moving with us, right? Not moving and becoming programmers are not moving and becoming meme coin traders, right? <laughs> but that they're moving with us because they see a viable future forward. And that's that's like one of the areas is like I'm super optimistic about, but I think it actually requires technology, I hate to say it, to play a part in it so that the human bias aspects can be taken out of it. Um now yeah. for the other piece, remind me again what what your second question was. Your second question is uh so that's the piece that you expect. You expect better curation. Yep. Maybe uncertain the way that that happens, but you Correct. expect that in the future. The other thing is something that you don't necessarily expect that you would not guarantee us today, but it's still something you very much hope happens in the future. Artists that actually create art by hand are going to continue to be very, very powerful into the future, right? I'd like to think they're going to be very, very powerful into the future. My fear is that, right, that AI and the power of, you know, just taking patented styles from multiple different artists and the outputs are going to increasingly get better and better. And in time, you know, people will unfortunately end up buying more AI generated art than they would actually hand created or hand painted or digitally created art, right? And I think that would probably fall in that latter category, right? Where, you know, I, I, ideally I'd want to see the success of creators that actually spend 80% of their time creating and perhaps 20% of their time, you know, perhaps working with an AGI, working with some, you know, artificial intelligence to improve the output. But I have a feeling that, you know, that's that's going to be like flipped, right? I have a feeling that a lot of the output in the future, because this AI generated art and the volume of that art that's going to come out is going to it's going to saturate the market and make it very hard to it's going to make it very hard to find um you know art that um is unique and different, right? Um, that, that's, that's my fear. That's my fear. So you're hopeful that the human stays relevant. I'm, I'm hopeful that the humans stay relevant and that, you know, people who create by the hand and perhaps they augment with AI continue to stay relevant versus, you know, the machines taking over, right. And AI taking over and the AI artist, right. Uh, being the de facto, you know, best selling artist, right. Gaining, you know, the most notoriety. Right. So I guess that's where I go with it. I share that hope. I think that's a good one. I think it's a good one. It's a very relevant one because we're at the forefront. Um, it's going to happen very fast, but we are at the forefront of it still in some ways. Oh, for sure. So Barack, who should be on the future of art in the future? Perspective. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to actually pass it on to Bat Soup Yum. Surprisingly, right? Because I think Bat Soup Yum will have some interesting takes. I'm a fan. I think it's a great, that's a great recommendation. There's a lot of respect there. So I like that you went there and, and Barat, be selfish. Where can people find you? And in general, you know, your tie-ins to art to on cyber. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about your ties to 6529 to decentralization, angel investing, JPEG connoisseur, all elements of your visible bio. Um, be selfish, send people anywhere you want to check out, to explore, and obviously to keep up with you. Oh gosh, probably just my my Twitter um, 
I do all my shit posting on Twitter, right? So you know, <laughs> if, if you are so bored and so lack, lacking of original content that you uh, want to check, you know, somebody, somebody's feed, feel free to check my feed out, right? I, I pity you, but, you know, I, I, at the same token, <laughs> if, you, if you feel like you want to torture yourself, enjoy, right? Please, please go check out my feed. And I like, but about, and that's Cryberat, right? K-R-Y-B-H-A-R-A-T on Twitter. Correct. I like that your pin post is still your on cyber museum. Yeah, like I mean, it, it's 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 the thing that I'm most passionate about, right? Um, art is the thing that I'm most passionate about. I don't think I've changed that pin post for a long time. It's it's been there for a while. I think ever since I set the gallery up, it's been there, right? And probably will not be changed anytime soon because it would mean that you know I, either I've moved on from art as being important to me, uh, which would not be a good outcome. Well, you may or may not have had a visitor to that very gallery today that's, that's sitting right here talking to you. Very cool. Very cool. That makes one for today. Thanks, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> it's a W for today. Well, listen, Barat, there can only be one first episode of the Future of Art. I am honored it's you. I don't take your time for granted. Uh, you and Ryan and the, the entire On Cyber team, I think you're doing fabulous things. Obviously, always keep up with your thought leadership your your collector commentary and, and far, far beyond that. I'm, I'm still stunned and I think you're underrating yourself. I, I know there's an art skill or two uh, that you have, but haven't talked about today. Um, but man, this has been really, really enjoyable. I hope we're doing this again uh, a few years in the future. Hey, Roger, you're a scholar and a gentleman, right? I've enjoyed, um, you know, getting to know you better over the years and, you know, you're a partner on so many fronts and, fronts, and I'm super thrilled that you thought highly enough of me to have me on your first, uh, you know, your premiere uh, episode. And I am super thrilled and super stoked about that. Right. Anytime you ask, I'll be on, right. Super excited and uh, hope it's a value to you and your audience. Right. Um, most importantly, huge value. Appreciate you, man. Onward to the future. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for listening and for being part of the future of art. If you liked what you heard, please do subscribe and drop a review on your favorite podcast platform. Onward to the many interviews that await us. The Future of Art is produced by Artifex. Artifex, A-R-T-I-F-E-X, was created to honor today's top digital fine artists in three dimensions. Each artist, one of one work of art, becomes a collectible 3D sculpture and centerpiece of an immersive world built in Unreal Engine the creation tool of Epic Games. Visit at artifacts underscore project on Instagram to experience those sculptures in AR and visit artifacts.art slash unreal to literally step inside the art on your browser.